And I am just so delighted to see so many people here. I am just, I am so happy to have so many people here in support of Dream Streets number 51 and in support of the writing community in Wilmington. I'm going to be very brief. We have lots of readers tonight. I don't want to cut anything short. Um, so my first order of business is please silence your cell phones. Thank you very much. I also want to let you know that the exhibition Dream Streets Art in Wilmington 1970-1990 is open this evening. It's in the gallery directly behind me. If you haven't had a chance to see it, please do so. The curator of the show, Margaret Winslow, behind us in the green dress and the hand, if you'd like to ask me. I want to thank, first of all, DuPont for sponsoring the exhibition, and of course the Delaware Humanities Forum, which sponsored numerous projects in association with this exhibition. Most importantly, we're here tonight because they sponsored Dream Streets number 51. They helped us design and print it. So I just have a few words to read. This program is partially funded by a grant from the Delaware Humanities Forum, a state program for the National Endowment for Humanities. The Forum, an independent agency, promotes understanding and appreciation of the humanities and their relevance to current issues of public concern. Any nonprofit group or organization in Delaware can apply for a grant. Also on your chair, you'll notice you have evaluation forms. If you could kindly fill those out on your, on your way out, I do have a full stack of pencils over here. Lastly, just a quick plug for a few upcoming exhibitions. Um, next week on July 23rd, the Wilmington Film Festival will be at the museum with Geo Stewart. And we have two more gallery talks. There was one on Thursday. We have one on Thursday, August 20th, and Thursday, September 17th. Um, you can find the artist information for those talks on our website, delart.org. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen. Thank you. It's, it's good to see all of you here. Um, tonight's reading um, is going to be a little different than maybe some of the ones that you've uh, attended before. Uh, I want to refer you to our little program because that will serve as the introduction to all the readers. They will just come up here and read in the order in which uh, they're listed. Uh, and uh, the reason they're listed in that way is explained in the little paragraph under Green Street's Literary Reading. Now, while you're perusing that or just sort of checking it out, I want to let you know that many of us and a few others have uh, books for sale right outside the door here. Uh, you're welcome to take a look, and if you see something that you uh, like, uh, support your local poet and author. Um, so, Without further ado, we'll get this thing rolling, and uh, I'd like to start off by introducing one of the founders of Dream Streets, uh, and he'll kick it off. Uh, please welcome Lou Bennett. and in New York City, but I've been more than 40 years in Delaware, went to college, raised my family here. And for tonight, I have two short things. One goes all the way back to the founding of Dream Streets. Besides writing individual poems, I was into a series of poems. So this one, Bronstein, went to over 50 poems. I'll read one short one from here. Uh, it's based on an autobiography, and I wrote poems in here about uh, the man's childhood, adolescence, and life in his 20s. Nothing beyond that. Of course, I was roughly 30 when I did this. So, uh, I'll read the first one, as sort of like talking about the coming of the Industrial Revolution in rural Russia. Talk of the city, forest of trees, row after row, numerous as trees, factory fantasies, new watch and boots, fascinating younger men, elders stuttering, loose women and drink, turn back to safety of field work and 
bare feet. And while this was mostly written in the 70s and then revised early in this year, I have written one poem this year, very short one. Uh, my mother-in-law died a few months ago, and you know, that's natural, of course, of things, but with deaths I found, I often think of earlier deaths in my life, and particularly my brother Matt, uh, who died earlier on, and my brother Steve, another Dreams and Dreams contributor, went down, had to take care of all the odds and ends, and Steve uh, actually designed uh, the headstone, which is about maybe that high. And I think, well, leaving that space as, uh, let's say, a stanza, what could I write about myself, my epitaph, uh, when my time comes? Because I think thinking about death, I also think ahead to you know, perhaps my own death. So this is my epitaph. SDS, LSD, poetry, psychology, karate tai chi, love and family, breathing consciously, Ph.D. Da Fiomi. Look at her tail and fins, dummy. 
Well, a mermaid, a mermaid, the third cried, clapping his hands. A senior citizen mermaid, the girl said. <laughs> <laughs> Their windbreakers hissed as they swooped around the mermaid, ignoring Abe and Tucker. The dog sniffed at her fins and growled. More kids came running from the boardwalk. They shrieked and gawked and took pictures. They texted and called their families and friends, who by the time they arrived, didn't see the mermaid for the crowd. As things turned out, once the mermaid was resuscitated in a sailing tank, Rehoboth Beach claimed her as its own found subject. The city built a steel pier and a fence in a limpy pool by the boardwalk and charged a $10 admission to see the marine wonder of the world and pride of Rehoboth Beach, Marion the Mermaid. The mayor had named her after Maid Marion, Robin Hood's love interest associated with May Day. A dermatologist removed the barnacles from her arms and hands. A beautician untangled her hair. When Tucker Hicks told his daddy he didn't want to be in the spotlight, Abe claimed he was the one who'd found Marion. The media publicized his buried life as a charter boat captain, building inspector, carpenter, short order cook, and divorced father. Tucker admired and loved his dad all the more for taking the credit. <laughs> Marion spent no time trying to adjust to the pool, looking first bewildered and then distraught by its confines. With her powerful fin, she swam ceaseless laps underwater, her arms by her sides, her white hair streaming down her back. She could swim a half hour before coming up for air. Marine biologists and dolphin trainers failed to communicate with her, and she didn't respond to the whale music her managers played by her pool. <laughs> Whales have been hunted to near extinction. Their music is too sad. How about a polka? Said the mayor, who was the second generation of a family from Warsaw. <laughs> Marion's managers hired a polka band and dancers, but she kept swinging, swimming her laps, seeming oblivious to all but her incessant motion. The managers tried circus music, opera, heavy metal, punk, doo-wop, surfadelic, grunge, pop, and rap, to no avail. <laughs> People said she was deaf and that her human ears were remnants of sense organs she dispensed with long ago. Others claimed she had too much water in her ears to hear anything. And there were those who suspected she was an autistic mermaid, given her aloofness and compulsive swimming. Crowds from around the world came to see Marion, the ancient sea goddess, washed ashore in a hurricane. Hotels were booked a year in advance. Boardwalk vendors made record sales. When she rejected the mackerel and squid, her managers tried to feed her. Tourists brought her granola bars, lychees, bruschetta, kielbasa, animal crackers, tofu turkey, cotton candy, and corn dogs. But she refused them and kept swimming her laps, as if the sheer energy of this pursuit would deliver her to the sea a hundred yards away. She swam in a fever that raised the water temperature 20 degrees and produced steam on cold nights. Marion had been in captivity exactly a year when she finally communicated, revealing her true nature. A record crowd gathered on the pier on that sunny May afternoon. A huge banner, Happy Anniversary Marion, draped the entrance. Balloons with her picture rose in the breeze. A mythologist spoke about the origin of mermaids, citing Babylonian, Greek, and Roman legends. Abe and Tucker Hicks were there in their waders and fishing vests. Abe gave a short speech saying how he thought Marion was dead when he found her, till he held his knife by her nose and saw the mist her faint breath left on the blade. The crowd cheered, and the mayor shook his hand on the stage by the pool where Marion had surfaced. As she floated on her back, taking deep breaths, Abe sat down and cringed at the sight of her frantic eyes and quivering lips. How he wished he hadn't deliberated when Tucker found her and asked them what they should do. If only they had carried her back into the ocean before anyone else saw her. Marion, our gift from the sea, has turned Rehoboth Beach into an international resort, the mayor said, wearing a tailored navy blue suit. 
Our boardwalk attracts more people than the one in Atlantic City. Cooperation among the key drivers of our economic and social policies <laughs> has vastly improved. As the mayor yapped, Marion turned vertical, raising her human half above water. She opened her mouth and burst into song in a language no one understood. She was singing though, raising her melodic voice and holding her notes with the skill of a world-class contralto. The mayor shut up. The crowd stood transfixed by the song of this mermaid who'd been mute for a year. The mythologist ran onto the stage, grabbed the microphone from the mayor and cried, she's not a mermaid, she's a siren. <laughs> Marion spun about, singing in all four directions as people thronged the pool. Others palmed their ears, recalling Homer's odyssey and the sirens who lured sailors off course to smash their ships on the rocks and drown. Yet the faces of the men Mary and Lord weren't those of lovesick victims seduced by a water nymph, but of gallant heroes rushing to a damsel in distress. Why did she wait till now to break her silence? Many later said she knew she'd have a greater chance of escaping her prison if she drew the biggest crowd before she sang her plea for freedom. Although the mayor, the mythologist, and many others dashed to her rescue, it was A. Hicks who led them all, diving into the pool in his fishing apparel. He took Marion by the hand and swam to the side as she sang her song whose lyrics were of a universal language that spurred men to her aid. The mayor and Tucker pulled her out of the pool with an assist from Abe. The crowd cheered as Abe and Tucker carried Marion from the pier across the beach into the high tide. Many present would later swear she reversed her age on that walk. So by the time father and son let her go, her top half was that of a beautiful young woman with ruby lips and raven hair. Like a fish caught and released, she dove into the waves and was gone. Thank you.
removing a good layer makes the work worthwhile. Um. When I finally had a reverent experience, that is, um, something bringing to life an incident and feeling and reliving it that you had forgotten many, many years before. And I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm finally a poet. This is called Artificial Weather Makers. Except for an occasional dusting of white powdery flakes between gray blades, there was no snow in Vermont. Winter chill bites deep, nakedly brown, the ground keeps the jello mold footprint of a large dog, each round toe hole filled just to the brim with white crystals. One morning, brother and I took the pink cardboard box of scented powder from our mother's dresser top and sprinkled the entire contents on the bedroom carpet. We took turns shaking the shaggy puff, obscured each woven flower and ribbon design. We created a snowstorm and, like careful gods, left no footprints in the perfect white. Grandmother discovered us by our silence and that <laughs> after <laughs> She sat us facing each other in the living room, the tips of our fingers tucked under the edges of our thighs, left small round indentations in the brown plush of the upholstery. January, no snow in Vermont. <laughs> My kitten discovered lightning bugs last this past week, and I myself love them and look forward to them every summer. This is called Night Lights. From the beginning of time, children have caught lightning bugs, keeping them in jars, capturing their light to chase away the dark from their dreams. How do adults, in all of their practicality, <clears throat> catch the light that keeps the darkness from their dreams? How do they believe in enchantments? How do they survive with monsters under beds and in closets without lightning bugs to save them? And I think this poem, now this is a, a much more recent poem, but I think this poem kind of um, talks about my life. It's called The Leap. When we jumped across that five-story chasm, rooftop to rooftop, your urgency was so great, I did not stop to think threw you my shoes, and leapt. When squirrels fly from tree limb to tree limb and spread a little web of skin from their bodies as sails, they do not need a catcher on the other end to grab them from the half-missed ledge and haul them in breathless. Later, down on the pavement in my rhinestone heels and sheath party dress, you in tight sweater and flat shoes, 
We walked as though no one could question us. I met a woman who never left her house. All she knew was closed within her doors, rearranging little piles of stale life. She never left from roof to roof, not even across the chasm of her mind. But we did, and I can leap and sometimes fly like the little squirrel. In my heart, the branch is always there. But even if I miss, I always walk as though no one can question me. <laughs> Lace makers. We are the lace makers. 
more aware of the shape of the holes, making what is not there that which is most beautiful. We are the lace makers, taking the least and making from it the most. Arachne, challenging Minerva, web spinners, industrious little <coughs> spiders weaving from essence a substance that in turn becomes essence, making of what is not there the most important. We are the lace makers, tatting and tying, shuffling and knotting, entangling and ensnaring, trappers of nothing, trappers of everything, shapers of holes, of openings, of exits and entrances. We are the entrances and exits, the weavers of bales, the wearers of bales, the terrors of bales, the reweavers, the menders of bales, the reweavers of emptiness, tenders of the spaces between the gossamer threads. We are the lace makers. I'm Philip Bernowski. I'm going to read you three poems from a themed collection called Hokobo the Turco. It's about an Ecuadorian youth of mixed indigenous and Lebanese immigrant heritage. Now, uh, Ecuadorians like to call these Lebanese Turcos. Uh, this young man aspires to come to the United States. He succeeds. He's deported to Lebanon where he has never been and ultimately ends up in Guantanamo prison. First poem is entitled Registration Open. Inscripción abierta, programa de work and travel, a Estados Unidos. Requirements. It's very good English. Regular post secondary or university student, up to 20 years of age, available to travel to the United States from June to September 2004. Registration Open, taped upon the tapia of my mother's birth house wall between a window on Peguche and my peeling scheme of Levittown, USA. Houses like rectangular beads woven in the tapestry of my dreams. Indio, Turco, or Mono, to soak in my Lebanese father's medicinal pools or bathe in womb waters braiding this town with aqueducts, cascades, riverlets, and birthing stains in moonlight. Hello, Pacha, says Moon. You are Earth. Hello, Jacobo. You are your father's bastard. The midwives hung my mama Pacha in a blanket, rolled her back and forth like a top, strapped her arms to eucalyptus rafters in the old way, let hers and the Earth's energy draw me down till I, like myriad kin, microbial to mammal, was born in an ocean of blood, shit, Earth, and my mother's microbiome. Moonbeams, she says, parted the clouds concealing in Bolora, poured a blue prism through this window cut in tapia, and right here gave me light. A week later, Pacha brought me to my father, my unnamed face doubtless stained with breast milk poo. He did love me, right from Colegio Americano, to Pontifical Universidad Católica, School of Tongues, Inglés, Requirements, Muy Buen Inglés, that's me. Goodbye, trousers, white and ponchos, blue, embroidered blouses and blue wool skirts, mamacitas, gold glass beads and wristlets, coral and carnadine. Goodbye, house of Mother Earth. Hello, American dream. Second floor, catching chickens. Any of you speak English? said to the leftover and hopeless Mexicans and me, 
waiting for work, baked by day and stale by nightfall, like pizzas I'd made all summer in Rehoboth on a J-1 visa. The Russians stole my passport, pay and ticket home, and there I was, hungry. But now, Our Lady saved the day. My English overflowed with accents I'd taken with the tips. Collegiate grandma, six-pack Joe, yes sir, I am the man. Yes you are, and I was in the van on the floor, propping myself with palms and slick straw about the boots of four blacks already aboard. You like chicken, the boss man said. You bet I do. And the black men laughed. Like a lone star in the manure firmament that was the warehouse, a single light bulb shone on thousands of white chickens across the sea of dark dirt. They roiled softly like expiring foam, clucking mild reproaches at our approach. A giant goosenecked machine with the face of rubber snakes sat menacingly by the automated chicken catcher, sidelined for repairs. We would catch the chickens. Mamacita, in the mornings under Miss Vivian Ballora, would slip her padded hands beneath the hen, cradle it sweetly while cooing quichua words of love. With one hand, hide, with one hand, hide, its, hide with one hand its eyes from her little act of shame, grasp and like a chain whip of shoulder, elbow, wrist, and neck. Ah, halal is not so merciful. <laughs> Let's work, Jose. One waded into the chicken surf to hook two, three, four, five pairs of chicken legs between his knuckles, fling them like feather dusters into a wire shelf, shake them to the rear and reload. It looked easy. The chicken. Too surprised to be undocile to my comrades, fought me like gamecocks, left the cues in from the sticking shells and left them empty when the forklift came. Put some ass into it, Jose, we ain't gonna carry you. Behind is always twice the work, ahead you pass the bottle. When I finally got a sip, it filled the pores of my thirsty bones with grace. Thanks, my name's Hobobo. Call me Fee Patch, Jose. We're here always. Now, nah, we're scabs. Union in, get an auto catch chicken catcher. Auto catcher break, hire scabs and wetbacks. That's why they call America the land of opportunity. <laughs> and that was true, since the boss man fed me cheese and mayo sandwiches and offered me a job packing cut up chickens, which pea patch would not do. Shit, my people did this shit for 400 years. Your turn now, Jose. Had our lady, who had lifted me from the river of misfortune, now dropped me in the melting spot. And finally, falling, burning, drowning. Physical pain amounting to torture must be equivalent to intensity to the pain accompanying serious physical injury, such as organ failure, impairment of bodily functions, and even death. J.S. Biden, and Miranda to the president. There is no pain in falling, just as sometimes there is no answer to a question. Scale the sky's blue dome on the narrow path that skirts the, the stone summit of Ingobora. Far below, the town is a crumpled map. When a pebble gives way, your hand grasps at air before you can think or pray. A prisoner, suspended by tethered wrists, the pulsing helicopter roaring in his head, his countryside sideways in the open bay tells all. We retreat from open windows, above the plunging cityscapes, even when chased by fire, for no one wants to fall, no more than burn or drown. They know everything about me but my innocence. Turn me backward on a slab, an acrid potion displaces air. My throat reaches for an answer, not there. Where'd you get that Arab name? Your passport, why'd you sell it? Why carve chickens in Delaware? Why sell drugs, donuts? Mrs. The Palestinian was Hamas, right? Mrs. Haddad, Hezbollah, why do you hate the Jews? I don't know where, why, or if, only put me on my feet and give me air. 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 Thank you. Yeah,
Michelle. I haven't read with this whole group for many, 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 many years. I was so surprised to get um, uh, to get a call from or an email from Steve. And so I put together some things over the course of the years that I've been writing poetry. And I live in New York now. I've been there for 22 some years. And um, New York is a strange place. And maybe I'll retire to Delaware. I don't know. Uh, this is from 1974, the first time I visited New York. It's called Vignette. Tomorrow, the subway. I shall go underground, take up knitting at fractions of the speed of sound, learn to tango alone. Sharks at Elm Point. <coughs> Elm Point is a place up in New Hampshire that I've visited many summers, but not this summer. We sit in the evening dealing cards, hearts or pinochle, a hand of solitaire, voices lapping in slow stories and strategies like the sound of the wave, the lake waves through the windows behind us. The winter smell of closed up mothballs slowly dissipates with the gain in skill at summer's card playing, passed on hand by hand from tents by candlelight and storm-bound oil lanterns down to us drooping with sleep need and too much rain. I lose game after game, but my ears and memories grow keener. One of my favorite forms of poetry is a sonnet. This is not a sonnet, it's almost a sonnet. So I have, I have an almost a sonnet form. So. I have some sonnets. Sonnet for a turn, almost sonnet for a turn in the road. Uh, for Nikki and Susan who are here somewhere. Uh, I was driving, driving to their house and I was crossing Creatures Bridge Road and making a turn there. And it was a very snowy, cold night. And all of a sudden I had this, I was overwhelmed with this spirit feeling. And I had to pull over and write this down. The snowbound, bending road gave way to dreams, and in deja vu, I was not en route to your house or mine this night. The black air felt thin and bracing cold, like moonlit streams that quickly course from melting glaciers. Out from this car-lit, crusted, tire-tracked bed, there peered wraiths from destiny's dark places, clutching road maps to dimly recalled towns in Nebraska, where winter's grip is hard and haunted by winds and open spaces. I remind my heart to beat. I hear sounds of wheels spinning and summers in your yard. In these ensuing years, I've learned to dance. I used to do contra dancing. I used to be young and thin, as I tell my friends and my college aides. Um, I did this in St. Louis, and I met a doctor there who did missionary work in Kenya, and he had a Maasai spear, and this is a poem about that spear. Uh, somewhere on the plains. This is a song. What is it in this grasp of Maasai spear that calls Morans to dream for battle posts? Simba? Chewy? Some Serengeti pier yet to be dinner as the conquered ghost? To heft the shaft is to feel its power, to hold the holder mesmerized, so keen in my memory that steel lived in the hour I took it from your wall, pounding blood mean in my ears, racing echo from a past where drumbeats throbbed in promising a feast. I looked into your eyes then, saw at last some ancient saving grace, and not a beast, no, not some supper trying yet to flee, a man with souvenirs, and only me. <laughs> I have a dear cousin who uh, died two years ago uh, from colon cancer, and to support her, I, 
I used all my vacation time because you can't take family leave from cousins. Um, I was part of Gilda's Club Network, which is in the United States, and I would go every week for a counseling session with a group of with a group of people all going through the same thing, and it was the most wonderful support group. And when I left that group, I wrote them this poem. These two hours. Sometimes it seems forever, and other evenings far too short. These two hours pass, and we grieve for the lives we, wi we used to have, the lives we wish we had, each other's minor miracles we wish again were our own, and sometimes they are. We spend these two hours staving off the relentless march toward death, like this year's flooding Mississippi. We know it will happen again and again, and no amount of tears or higher ground will change the pace of the lives we now have. These two hours, we hold on to each other's voices. We are a kind of life raft, tethered still to our separate planes, unwilling to cut any cords, unwilling to flow too far from each other's sights, knowing our separate planes will sink and we must cut the cord. But that day, that day is still days or weeks or months, weeks maybe, ahead of us. And the holding on is hard. We remind ourselves that we have muscles we did not know we had, that we ourselves can still swim, can learn to breathe quickly, deeply, while our own heads are above the water, and that our swimming, our patience, our patina of strength, even if it seems a little false at times, all of it, the uncertainty, the doubt, the faith, saves the drowning hands we cling to for a little while longer, for at least two hours. Mm -hmm. My mother and the squirrels, another son. It was with peanuts my ma tamed those squirrels. She'd throw them out. The squirrels would scamper down, two or three or four, semicircle grown around the door, flip to this one, that one. Her aim faltered only as she aged, then took to staring back when she could not throw. Squirrels still came to porch. How could they know a now old woman sat with her old girls, putting just one shelled nut within their hands? That's Petey, that's John. She didn't wave. The semicircle moved back and gave clearance to the door again and again. Fans of my mom always called her amazing. I see her still with squirrels, sitting, gazing. <laughs> Rainy Night, Brooklyn, 2003. Please do not change bicycles to fence. Was on a posted sign beside the door. What should we do then? Set them free. For more information, I long to ring a bell, find a landlord who'd say such a thing, tell him or her a thing or two on grammar, clear expression, but more likely stammer out some question about what was meant, hence, what was the point? I had no light to lock, no lock, no chain, no key, no real reason on this rainy night in May to even talk about the lack of pleasant season. Someone did come and ring. No one was home. It seemed the house, like fence, was all alone. <laughs> and my last two poems. This was for a news piece on um, NPR. It's called Broadcast Effect. And I'm addicted to NPR, I should say. Um, I want the suitcase they mentioned in the news, the one where you can serve 24 people tea in the jungle. I want to go to that jungle with you and 22 others, with blessings on our company and mission, drink Darjeeling or Earl Grey, feel elegant in the midst of chaos, find the lost uncle's grave, Her toast to his memory with champagne in thin stemmed flutes, air freighted specially to our location through the magic of GPS via UPS, and return to civilization triumphantly on the backs of poor endangered elephants. On the other hand, 
Perhaps this may be better left to fantasy, where it can indeed come true. What if the suitcase can't be found or cost too much? Not to mention airfare for all of us and air freight for our beverages. What if we all die from a horrible disease trying to find the right jungle with no Christ for a miraculous recovery? What if there are no jungles left? What if they invent time travel in some possible future, according to Hawkins, and spirit that uncle away? Turn off the radio, go back to sleep. <laughs> And my last poem is another vignette. Um, I don't know if you, they, they make those magnetic poetry kits. Well, they make one for New York City. And so this is a poem based on magnetic, it's called Magnetic Poetry. Watch Broadway Heat. Ask at Liberty Fair. Boutique Borough, Manhattan. Jazz Park, Brooklyn. Trendy Architecture District, <coughs> West Village, Neon Empire, <laughs> Guggenheim, Whitney, Harlem, Airport Nights, a huge city, exhaust. Thank you. These are all written in the form 
format of ITU, so they all begin with I. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're all autobiographical. <laughs> this one is not especially autobiographical. <laughs> it is called To a Corpse with the Hiccups. <laughs> <laughs> Try shutting up. <laughs> I tell you to drink a glass of water and hold your breath, but, well, look at here. I bet cremation would have shut you up. <laughs> At least you're not farting. And curable, that's what you always want. Carrying humanity to a fault, like a foundling to a doorstep with a padlock door. So now you've given up the ghost, but not the hiccups. It's embarrassing in such a quiet room. You're jolting the flowers, and the children are giggling through their fascinated dread. Adults keep checking their watches. Better you'd swallow a ticking clock. Or a bomb. A bomb would be just like it. <laughs> Next. Basically a true story. Oh, my sweetheart, Statue of Liberty. I was once inside your head, long ago, and literally, too, as a tourist. A young man then, I was full of promise, but you know how promises can break when they fall on hard times. Still, I really have tried to stay faithful to you, even though I find myself now in later life tired and poor, my wretched mask often huddling. Okay, so I don't team on a shore. Must I be perfect? Will you keep the love light burning and let me call you sweetheart? I am in love with you, even though it scares me how hollow you can be. <laughs> but then it is my task to hoist the old heavy vow to help make you full. <laughs> and this one is absolutely a personal memory. It's a picture I have of my own imagination as a child. To you, black boy, from me, white boy. I don't remember if I ever sang that eeny, meeny, miny, mo that once caught you by the toe. You dangled there in my mind against blank twilight, so lonely looking I felt sad, swirling softly as a calder mobile or chandelier lilting with a twitch when the rocks of the world tremble. Naked as the day we were born. Ah, so skinny, as you flailed your arms and one leg free, gazing about with crane's neck, and so bewildered, you could not yet holler to be let go. <laughs> And I'll end now with the ending. And unfortunately, this is all too true for myself as well as so. It's to the reader. Thank you for reading this book. If you're only reading this page, thanks for that. If you've only heard of this book, thank you for your ears' attention. If you have no knowledge of this book, but may learn someday, thanks in advance. <laughs> if you are born and die never having heard of me, thank you for accidentally enriching my world with your existence. If you don't exist, never did, and never will, thanks for not cluttering up the place. <laughs> I'm desperate.
<laughs> I'm Arabella Bianco, and thank you all for coming and taking time out of your day to come and hear us read poems. Um, the founding of Dream Streets was more than just a magazine coming into being. It was a true adventure, and it's an adventure that has not yet reached its end. And I'm so very happy to see so many of my old partners in poetic crime here today. And um, it's just really good to see you all. Um, there's a town on the north coast of Spain, I'm told, called Vigo. And it's kind of like a touristy, kind of a boardwalk town. And um, and they have this floating dock. It floats up and down on these piers, making a strange rubbing sound. I've never been there, but I have some friends who spent some time there, and they asked me to write a poem about it just from my imagination and what they told me. And this is it. It's uh, called Vigo Dock Movement. And it's a real tongue twister, so bear with me. Off to il ristorante de la Spagna, wheel suntan Caesar Marty Pluto in his flamingo and black T bird with a silk tie reservation for one. Inside, bouffant babe Cleopatra McAllister, planet of origin Texarkana, all straps, garters, and fishnets, bare shoulders succulent like ravioli. <laughs> slings him a flambe platter of gold and vermilion prawns royale, 18 euro plus tax. Her alien hands limpid as scallops. Stash, stud a bang, stud a bangity bang, stash. Jim rod laces into the snares and hi hats, just as Kokomo Rex sends his platinum plated sacks. Squalling right through the roof, wiggling deliciously up to the fluted edge of the dance floor, Cleo swats down a grand blue progression of chords on her itinerant Steinway and belts out, My mama done told me, so hot it would juice the dead. CP looks up amazed from his protein massacre, ravaged linguini idiotically dangling from the corners of his mouth. Tonight's special, Jazz Bow's Cacciatore. <laughs> <laughs> now this poem, this is a very early poem that I wrote. And um, it's always been one of my favorite poems of mine. The odd thing is, although I wrote it almost 50 years ago, I've never been able to adequately title it. <laughs> Not satisfactorily to me. So it's going to remain untitled. The sun is shining on a street of silver, but I'm moving to a shady quarter just beyond the flash. Ride a comet, swim an ocean with only one <coughs> kick. Something's coming. Something incredibly quick. Golden eyes, silver circling song. Someone's coming. Someone's already gone. I wonder what it's like to be a toy, marching stiffly along in a wind-up world of toys, slowing down at the last, and then breaking, regardless of care. I find part of a lost love back there. She's a blue lace button lying dead in the unknown grass. Oh, the sun is shining on a silver street, and I am moving. Thank you. And I'm going to conclude with. Um, a poem from the late 70s, not too long after Dream Street started, and I'm going to read it primarily because I know there's a couple of people here who really like this poem. Uh, this was part of kind of a, a time period when Dream Streets and its critters were going through like a mystical phase, I guess you would call it. So we were all writing mystical 
Collins. So this is my contribution. It's called Resurrection County. I was fast asleep down there when the holy blue tractor sailed overhead, turned me up with the time of its ineffable tiller, and left me here to spit the stones out of my mouth and have a few scattered thoughts about the decline of cities. There it goes, driven by a giant ladybug, escorted by black and white women with green hair on green zebras. On to the furrowed horizon, I look up. The sky is clear and silver with sapphire vapor trails. I look down. The earth is black and brown and red and yellow and white. And now a whole new urge comes over me as I plant my feet in the heart of the earth and I rise up, up like a fountain of grain and I unfold in the clear silver sky and all the airplanes of the air are landing in my arms. Thank you. Salogian. Uh, it's about a girl in India at the time she was 17 years old. My wife is from India, so we spend a lot of time and watch this young lady grow up. So the poem is written about a time that was a number of years ago. Salogian. Still as a clock vine, on a windless day, she sits on a brick pile near the barbed wire fence behind the factory. In the sweltering heat, a day laborer walks along the adjacent lane. Eyes glued to the book on her lap, she doesn't look away. Turning the pages, fingers thin as hibiscus stems, her hand's beauty doesn't obscure the violence of her focus. The way she stares at the page, daring it to withhold its knowledge. Salochina comes from the poorest of poor backgrounds. Today, she's a little over 40. She's a school teacher. She still reads. She's taken over the matriarch position in her family from her mother, although her mother's still alive. It's a house with a wonderful father and husband in it. But it's a matriarchal house. They got three women in that house that would not be over. And Salochina is one of them, right? You know, these are the heroes that we need to look for, right? They're in everyday life. And people often think of poetry as self-exploration. And I've certainly written a lot of poems that deal with myself and my background. But one of the real pleasures and disciplines of it is trying to concentrate enough that you can enter into the rhythm of other people's lives and at least get a partial glimpse of those lives through their eyes, not yours, you know? Here's another one. This poem is called Volsky, age 64, Long Beach, New York. I come from New York. It's a different kind of triumph. The color of mackerel frozen in ice, his hollow cheeks. Shivering, he leans against the wall. The January wind, languages beginning, sweeps across the boardwalk, not far from the peak club, nailed shut for years. Like a fur needle, tapering to nothing in the Russian forest, he'll never see. History leads to him. 
When me and your papa first comes here from Corbin, his mother used to say, we lose track what real cold is. That was then, he thinks. The granite Atlantic beneath the drab sky as seen by gray eyes makes him feel triumphant. <laughs> the place, this place, the pure dead weight of it, possesses the solidity he needs. No junk in his veins for nine years now, he dares the wind to screw with him. Decades earlier, in 69, when the Nautilus Hotel burned down, black smoke billowed above snow piles, carrying with it everything but the icicles that even now pry open his eyes. <laughs> When he pulled himself together, never fantasized again. I don't mean that in a bad way. He saw what was in front of him. He saw the world. And if that isn't a triumph of self-education, I don't know what it is. Now, this poem is called Growing Old, Death Still Disgusts Me. Um, it was written on my 71st birthday. <coughs> and it's in memory of a person far younger than me who died that day on my birthday. You died the day I turned 71. Couldn't hold on, I guess. You should have known my Uncle Adam. Fingers thick as railroad ties. His calloused hands never unclenched once he grabbed hold of something, a twine spreader at the Plymouth rope making factory, or playing baseball, a catcher who never dropped a pitch. Oops, lost my place. Oh, but you, my young friend, that wasn't your style. Your hands didn't have the strength to grab a car bumper or stop sign pole and pull yourself up alive and still smiling in spite of being filled with bullets. Wasn't your fault, though, with all that lead weighing you down. Unlike Uncle Adam, who'd never been shot, and also unlike him with his craggy, lined face and white get-in-free-pass to every bar in town, you knew all about cops shooting to kill, whether you had a weapon or not knew even before getting gunned down. You're the dividing line now, son. The cadaver we all must step over to relocate the Boneyard's library of unknown events. You're our Gaza Strip, stretched between desert and sea, where people huddle in bomb buildings and even the doves cooing in the rubble wear bulletproof vests. Yes, you are the divide between eating dirt and spitting it out, between whites tossing back shots of communion wine while talking big and doing nothing, and other whites, punk rockers, hip hoppers, eater at the dumpster's diner, slackers, art masters, painting pictures on the eyelids of hypocrisy's advertisers, all these mobbing together on moonlit street corners, finally going crazy, screaming against the making of so much grief. <laughs> that Michael Brown was uh, killed on my birthday. And, uh, and I say this, you know, a lot of white people in this room, I'm a white person, I'm not African American. But we have to rise up against this stuff. It's going on for too long. I read my poem, so I won't say any more right now. <laughs> um, oops, just let me get this one last poem. <coughs> okay, I'm reading this poem because my grandson, or one of my grandchildren, decided to come to this meeting tonight. And I wrote this for him. I think maybe eight years ago, when he was four years old. And we were in, in, in India. 
It's been there a few times. And um, the title of the poem is, I show my four-year-old grandson the world from a widow's back door, or through a widow's back door. The front door, we open the front door, or the widow opened the front door, or the woman we know. And you could just see straight through the house to the light going through the, through the back door, which was open. It was a lane back there. To the left, the lane leads to Pipeline Road, then to the temple up the hill. To the right, it winds past Anand's ruined factory toward the jail. To both left and right, a variety of paths intersect the lane, leading collectively anywhere anyone wants to go. This is what we want to leave our children, that these possibilities can be real for everyone. Thank you so much. Forgotten the flesh, and the flesh is no more. Whiz bang Billy being such from the desert back when reminders filled the fields, cactus whisper against the cool, snake striking clouds can't hear yourself think it's so. Laurels they throw, sucking their gloved hands, kicking in, filling the air with media, themes made in coffee pots by Alchemax. How can you feel, he said in sign language, you fear McTam acknowledge no fool, say instead that it is the clothes I wear that is I himself. After all, it is you yourself that long to be seen. Let the light pass by, it goes quickly into darkness and still will twinkle in the scheme, the widening of your notions. Woven fabrics are your laurels, have you exist as one with a scheme and where heaven and a clothe keep you warm between intersections. But birders they be deaf and do never hear complaints, for their deafness is not the ear. For they are only suits of clothes, no thing between the threads, carry no thing. <laughs> Uh, many of us who have been writing for uh, many years are haunted by the spirits of those who have come before us, I especially. But I can acknowledge a few uh, writers from the past who, uh, even though they are part of the American literary canon, are part of the uh, local area. And I speak about people like Walt Whitman, who was basically a mid-Atlantic writer, but especially Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, we know that in new art, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's memory is especially cherished. And to do that, and to continue that feeling, I'm going to read a poem about Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, this is a poem called uh, Poe Speaks from the Dead, or from the Grave. And it's for Armistead Gordon, who was actually a friend of Poe's, barely mentioned in any biographies because Armistead Gordon was black. Uh, if you think about the uh, uh, novel, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, that gives you an idea of that acknowledgement. Uh, we believe that Arthur um, Armstead Gordon was a servant, and I put that kindly, of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia, and was manumitted by Thomas Jefferson after uh, Jefferson had died. 
and we believe that that's where uh, Poe and Armistead uh, met and became friends. Uh, this also begins with a little bit of verse from Edgar Allan Poe. And this is the verse. I heed not that my earthly lot hath little of earth in it, that years of love have been forgot and the hatred of a minute. I mourn not that the desolate are happier sweet than I, but that you sorrow for my fate, who am the passerby. Here's the poem. Poe speaks from the grave. My dear Armistead, my dark and fearful friend, I lie with demons now here in the end of my time in the earth that was not in me. For 150 years they have read my molten words, but do not see the truth of bloodless movement in the dead. I loved her faithfully and oh so many faces with delicate embellishments of my thought. But my passion running blood had brought only substance of the earth that races to my head, substance of the dead that moves we men to seek the demon's door and other such nightly lures. My hand handled the gold of access, my lip Touched the finest bourbon gold could buy. I laced my tea with fragrant tinctures of laudanum and cannabis, and this to bring her light into my eye from where she sat among the roses in the sky. The worms now writhe in me as I writhed in life upon the earth with only ugliness and torment to be consumed as worth. The worms now writhe in me, and now I see with rotted eyes how vain my cries of pain were to her ear, for she could never hear the substance of that earthless sight. How right it was to stuff my mangled self up that stack, how fitting to lie chopped up and bleeding beneath the floor, my watch still going tick-tack, tick-tack. How good it was to get sucked down into a whirling pool, for I alone have become the solemn cosmic fool. I shall no more awaken in the flesh. My templed soul has been taken and to mesh with the kingdom of the worm. My end has been extended long, for I am paying for all the wrong that I engendered in my turn in flesh. I will not speak words like Valdemar, nor will they wash up from the sea. I know for many that I am near, yet so very far. But she too is very far from me. My dear Armistead, my dark and earful friend, my blonde tressed Lenore has found her gruesome end and took away that gilded day, replaced it with the eyeless sights of El Dorado, fading, yet clung to vainly with a Montagato. In this solemn place which I lie, where the bells have long ago rung, every face has sung the haunts with them, and with that song did condemn my betrothal to Virginia Clem. Long ago has dried up all my gore. Long ago I cried into silence the song of my Lenore. The taste of bourbon and of rum has still with the swing of the pendulum. <laughs> oh, wash me in the golden waters of redemption. Take me up from this deep pit Take me up, up, up from this dank, smelling place and let me sit once more beside the face of young Lenore. Give me the cup of the Eucharist. Take me up, up, up through purple mist. Take me, solemn, loathsome, raven bird of your, uh, unite me with my young Lenore. Float me high above the sky, blessed with favor in her eye, 
Let my blood quench demons. Let them be the passers by. have a reading also held on the third Saturday. They will pick up again in September. I need the month of August to recoup. Uh, they are held at the Chris White Gallery downtown in Wilmington. That's at 7th and Shipley Street. And they are held uh, every third Saturday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I don't have a complete venue for uh, the next one. I can tell you that Pharaoh, the poet, some of you may be familiar with him, will be reading at that first one, uh, but I haven't completed the uh, scheduling. Now before I uh, say my last poem, uh, I, I do want to say to patronize our table, uh, check our, uh, our wares. Uh, our next poet is uh, someone who is new who has also read at uh, that third Saturday Dream Streets reading, and she represents the present. And before she comes up, I'll give you just one more short little poem. It's a limerick. So you know short. A man with a sore toe walked, and daydreaming night shines talked, like chain ringing bells of things pain never tells which are scenes of some seeking salt. Thank you, Stephen and everyone. My name is Sweet Franchon. Um, I am honored to be here and have the opportunity to share with you my work. I tell you, um, when I started coming to Stephen's um, poetry readings, I was just young, you know, I just wanted to write and share, no big deal. Um, and before I knew it, it's evolved into this thing <laughs> where I performed um, just recently Clifford Brown Jazz Festival. Um, I perform in venues and in functions that are not typical poetry readings. So it's been a very interesting evolution, but I finally have owned and accepted um, God's calling for me to use poetry and go in places where poetry often does not go. I do a lot of prisons. I do a lot of uh, teenage, uh, displaced teenage organizations and women empowerment stuff. So it's really interesting to me how this journey has come. And one of the first poems I shared at uh, Dream Street was um, one that I had written and I had never read aloud. It was amazing that I never read a poem and now that's all I did. So here we go. It's called Surely There's a Poem in It. I can't think of no thing that does not create poetry. The way he holds a toothpick in the corner of his mouth the way the wind blows across my face, crisp and precise, like it has a definite purpose. Potholes in the streets, dying and jumping from children's politics, racism in America. I'm addicted to buying shoes, grandma fried chicken, and open mic venues. <laughs> Illness, art, music, science, control, friends, beauty, feet, pain, anger, habits, fears, poems, everything and everywhere. I can't think of no thing that does not create poetry. You see, poetry is littered in the streets of New York, LA, Philadelphia, Atlanta, San Antonio, Sea to Shining Sea. Look around you. Our streets are littered with it. Walls covered in it. People <coughs> living and dying in it. See, you see that? Surely there's a poem in it. <laughs> This journey, um, as Bob has said earlier, is that originally I wrote, I'm sharing with you um, from my book, which is now unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but show the times, is only in digital format. If you purchase the t shirt, I'll be glad to send it to you for your 
Um, part of this is that you you write and you share about yourself, but the blessing is that you also have, have an opportunity to peek into um, sometimes the lives of others and get to write about it and share it. And having now um, being this public uh, performer, everybody thinks every time I write it's about me. No. <laughs> um, and so oftentimes they think they know me, but they misinterpreted the, the poem, but it's okay. So this one I wrote because I had a friend going through a little something and I wanted to help her find her space. And it's called Some Days. And it's her talking about her a love of relationship. Some Days. Some days just knowing our connection is enough. It's enough to sustain me. It is one of the pieces to my joy, a portion of my peace, a bit of my bliss. Sometimes the ache of our closeness doesn't feel like a gaping hole in my heart. And other times it's so deep and vast that I can't catch my breath. On those days I slip into a temporary rabbit hole of yearning, where I reach and jump, jump and reach for that space of just knowing again so that I can cope without your physical presence. Then there are days like this when I just allow myself to miss you. I allow myself to cry, to ache, and to sit and wait until it goes away. Sometimes your call and your voice is enough to move me back into a healthy place. Other times I write poems to release it. I dance to move it. I eat to dissolve it. I shout to push it. Anything just to move it back to a pure space. Most times I simply live with a hole in my heart, carrying around knowing that I have you but I don't have you all at the same time. Oftentimes I dwell in memories of perfect moments so that I can still walk in my own joy. I can dance in my own peace. I can create my own bliss. Day to day, moment to moment, until my pieces are whole again. And then you have the opportunity, as most of share, you get to speak from your voice, and sometimes it's what you see, what you witness, and sometimes it's what you hold it to be. Other times it's what you expect it to be, and then there's what you plan on creating it to become. And I, um, from the west side of Wilmington, third of room, <coughs> purchased a family home there when my kids were young. Was all excited about this big old five bedroom house, and then things changed in my neighborhood. People started talking about how bad it was. And I knew it was changing, but still, you know, we, I had good neighbors, and so I thought I would capture some of that in a poem called um, Urban Dreams. <coughs> Actually, I'm sorry, before that, I talked about what I saw, how I saw it changing, and I actually wrote a poem before that called um, To Re Remain Righteous. <clears throat> some of you may have and some of you may have not, but I have lived in the belly of the social economic beast. Among others who have lost their way, forced to sw swallow the vial of poverty, walked among the hopeless and the living dead. Yet the divine light still speaks to me and peeked at me through the darkness beckoning me to just take one step forward, always calling my name, sweet, sweet. The universe is teaching me something. It's telling me something. It's challenging me to show the light in the darkest places. So as I walk down the street in the shadow of death, I still stand in gratitude in every breath. And I'm rewarded with peace of mind, good health, and blessing. As I stand in a sea of pain and human frailty, I shall fear not. 
I long to seek the divine light. And as long as I do that, I will always, without fail, know it will reveal itself. Therefore, I am thankful and protected. I walk with gratitude in light in the darkest places. In the shadows, I am unafraid. I walk in the shadow, in the belly of the beast. Urban dreams. I just want to witness the wonders of the world and cry from the absolute beauty of it. I want to loosen up and dance foolishly with my children, have water fights after dinner and laugh hysterically in the middle of the grass like no one's watching. I want to open my eyes and get out of this reality trance caused by too much work and not enough play. I want to find my joy in my work and therefore pass that light on to others. I want to walk barefoot in the forest, watch characters in my urban neighborhood while sipping grape Kool-Aid and watching ghetto kids play, tag football in the street, and the neighborhood adults yell, CAR! <laughs> I want to plant an urban garden full of homegrown vegetables and fresh herbs, toss them in tomato and onion salad like my grandma used to make, sit in the heat of July with whiffs of barbecue floating amongst the city blocks. I want to be still and listen to the answers to my prayers. I want to motivate, motivate others and help them find light at the end of dark tunnels. I want to smile simply for no reason at all. I want to discover something good in my neighborhood. In all that I meet and hence share a moment of true love. I want to believe in rainbows and dreams again. And as an old poem once said, I want to love like I've never been hurt before. In my urban neighborhood, we have dreams. How about you? <coughs> I've been fortunate enough to record um, with music. I work with a couple of local jazz bands, Point Blank, Gerald Chavis, and the Point Blank Band. Perform with them at, um, all the time, everywhere. I mean, lately, we were good calls all over the place, events. And it's called um, Can't Hardly Wait. You can download it on iTunes as well. And I composed and wrote a poem um, called Lover's Conversation with a singer in another jazz band called Anaya Jazz Band. You can also get that on iTunes. So I'm just very grateful that I'm able to share my work in other mediums. And it's starting to um, catch on, so to speak. And um, I just pray that I'm still able to give, you know, represent Wilmington well, represent um, those whose voice I think I share. And I just thank you again, and I'm honored to be here tonight, and I'm going to close out with one more. I wrote this poem um, when I was in the military. I was being shipped out to go to South Korea. Um, you know, and I had heard and understood that, you know, they didn't fly us on the best, best plane, but I'm like, mm, be all right, right? <laughs> and um, I got on this big old plane, biggest plane I've ever seen in my life. I can't remember, recall now uh, what uh, model it was. But I remember sitting there and I was like, oh my God, it's um, going to fall apart. <laughs> It looked like it was like bandaged up, tape was everywhere, it looked was leaking. I said, oh my God. And I'm looking at all the soldiers, it was Air Force, Army, Navy, you know, everyone on it. I said, we ain't gonna make it. I'm about to die at 25, whoever do, right? And I said, well, if I do, besides my dog tags, they're gonna find a home on me. <laughs> and no one way in the world, I'm gonna leave this earth without a poem being written, okay? In fact, it has inspired me to write ever since, you know? And I wrote the poem, and I was like, okay, they say, what do you check for? Your boots, your boots. So I wrote the poem, and I tucked it in my boots, and it was in my boots. I thought I was going to die. But I'm still here 20, 20 years later. So. Soulful journey. As my journey of life unfolds, like petals of a blooming rose, I stumble, I regress. I forgive myself and continue to give the universe my very best. Maintaining a position of love and respect to allow the energies of the Most High to simply manifest through me.
because I believe in peace of the soul and prosperity. Perfect I am not, always fighting so the ego does not control my actions nor my thoughts. Yet I continue to embark on this spiritual journey unique and written only for me. Judge me not, for my path is not straight nor all assuming. You know, like most, it is vast, colorful, limitless, and free. But yet, this soulful journey is special and unique, written exclusively for me. My name is Sweet Fran Shine. I hope that you live the colors of your life. I hope, I know this room is, this is a special room. Everyone here is so, has been so inspiring to me over the years and supported. And I thank you, I thank you, Steve, for having me. But one of the messages I try to use, some of us get to park because we're a certain age, because certain things have happened to us, or whatever that message you care about. I just hope that everyone in this room, even if it's just for a moment, a day, or prayerfully for the rest of your life, that you have the courage to jump, to leap, to fly, to live a colorful life, and paint it whatever color you freaking want to. <laughs> I paint mine in multi-color. I dream in color. And I just want to say poetry has been one of the most freeing things that I've ever done for myself. And I'm grateful that God has given me the courage to go into places that I never thought poetry would reach. And I thank you. And I wish you peace, love, and poetry. Big, but that, but that, but that, but that.